My name is Jennifer Bottomley O'Looney. I'm the program manager for the Montana Historical Society. And we are beyond thrilled to welcome our, new, our next guest, Nina Sanders, to the Montana History Conference. An Absolica curator, writer, curatorial consultant, Nina has worked in such institutions as the Smithsonian National Museum of American Indian, the School for Advanced Research, and the Field Museum, where she curated the groundbreaking ex exhibition, Absolica Women and Warriors, which was the largest exhibit of historical and contemporary items from the Crow Nation's history, and the first exhibit curated by an indigenous scholar at the Field Museum's history. This exhibit, This exhibit received rave reviews, having been called, quote, a robust and lively, innovative, and groundbreaking work, which really doesn't say enough about the exhibit. And here to talk about this incredible exhibit and the process for curating it is Nina Sanders. Please join me in welcoming Nina. Thank you. She forgot the most important thing, that I'm a Montanan. <laughs> I come from Montana. I come from several generations of Montanans. Uh, I'll introduce myself as I move forward. And because we want time for questions, I want to hear what you all think. Um, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so typically, I'm, I'm really not going to read this. I wrote it, but, um, you know, I guess I'll just read it. Montana, this place, this land, is a source of life and power. Many people over thousands of years have journeyed to this place to be a part of this source. Montana makes us strong. She forwards bonds between us and the land. Those who choose to call this place home are reformed by the power of this place. It is our stories and narratives that keep us connected, remind us of who we are, what we came from, and what is to come. Whether you are merged from this place, formed by the mud itself as we Absaluga understand ourselves to be, or a fourth generation descendant who imagines her grandchildren making a life on the banks of the Yellowstone, or even a newly minted wanderer enchanted by the supernatural presence of this place. We are bound by the water, the air, the dirt underneath our fingernails, and the continuous unfolding of the most magical narrative of all, Montana. So there's many things I think as a Crow person, as a native person, that I think resonate with Montanans. It's something we share. And when you come from Montana, no disrespect to those who don't, or if you just moved here, um, all are welcome. There's obviously a lot of room here. Um, it's where did you come from? Who's your family? How did you get here? What do you do here? Uh, these are questions that we ask people when we meet them. I'm sure all of you have asked these questions at your table and while you're meeting and mingling and getting to know one another. So I was raised by Crow women. My father is a Miklovich. His parents, his mother, came on a boat from Yugoslavia, traveled to Lodgegrass, Montana, built a pharmacy, a movie theater, and a bed and breakfast. And my grandmother, who was born in Yugoslavia and brought here as an infant, she had children from a man who was Blackfeet, whose mother was brought from Paradise Valley when the crows were taken to the Crow Reservation. She lived with crows. She decided, I'm just going to go with them. It was either that or be left behind. So she traveled to the Crow Reservation. Her name was Julia Jackson. She married a man who was uh, a descendant of one of Jim Bridger's uh, employees, one of those traders that we've all seen in the movie Revenant. Um, <laughs> And so, you know, looking at a lot of us have these sort of histories, right? We were connected to people like Jim Bridger and families who came on boats and built businesses and are still here. Um, most importantly for me, the women who raised me are Whistling Waters. That's a Crow clan. Um, these women taught me Crow. That was my first language. 
Um, I didn't speak English until I was maybe two, three years old. Uh, I went to school on the Crow Reservation, and to this day, I still live on the banks of the Little Big Horn Medicine Tal Coulee. If you've ever heard of Medicine Tal Coulee, that's where the Battle of the Greasy Grass was fought. You've probably traveled through um, my aunt and I. I brought my aunt with me, Bertie Rilbert. She also lives there alongside us. I brought my sons who've never seen me present before, so this is exciting. <laughs> Uh, that it's with Montanans, I'm like, this is, the, I've, I've presented in a lot of places, but you know, you guys are, I have to impress you, so I hope I do that. Uh, where you come from, who raised you, how were you raised, what are your values, these are things I think that are instilled in us as Montanans, and at the top of that list are family, relatives, hard work, courage, resilience, these are things that you have to have if you're going to live in this place. It doesn't matter where you came from, it doesn't matter where you live, the winters are hard. It's hard to have some of the neighbors that we do, especially the newcomers, God bless them. <laughs> um, I think these bonds that we forge with one another continue into the future and our children and their children, they all know each other and they can say, well, my great grandparents, they were friends and this is why we're still friends. This is something that happens in Montana that you don't see in too many other states, in too many other places. It's a blessing, maybe sometimes a curse, but we'll take what we can get. These are the Bighorn Mountains. Um, the Crow people, we believe that when we were made, as we migrated, as we journeyed through our lives, through many, many generations, we were to come to the Bighorn Mountains. And to this day, we believe that this is our source of power. This is the place that we were made to be. If you, are, if you know about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, uh, the pyramid of self-actualization, one might believe that Crow people have reached that summit and self-actualization is now at the precipice of who we are. We've figured out who we are, what our identity is, our clan systems, our belief systems, the tobacco society, all of these things were put before us to help us understand why are we here on earth. What is it that we're supposed to do while we're here? And those answers are actually very simple. It's love one another. Take care of the things that God gives you. Take care of one another. Be kind. Be generous. Work hard. Don't take things for granted. These are things I think that Montanans understand. So at the core of this, I talked about our creation. Uh, and I'm going to play this video here, if it'll let me. This is online. Helen Birhag as Shobesh Bachel, Bumushtak, Helen Bam Wam Bam Bab Suet, Chijil on the hand. Helen Birhagish, what a tajah, Bumushtak. The saga shall Birhag, Ashwa his shan, Bumushtak, Kulagon Chishili, Evi Shila Birhag, Haha, dark Kum Chishili, Ilana Birhag, Shogan, Kok Bumushtak, Chishili, Egypalia, in Chisik. Egypt Balia, Das Hurahal, He Dagoesa, Ah Ihaga, Birhaga, Hila Yagara, Bumushti. Egypt Balia, Ba O La Ship, Ah Na Birhagam, Hila Yagarish, Chishim, Helen Ija, Allah Tush, Egypt Balia, Na Birhagish, Dutta Kushahoha. Kalagonhna <laughs> 
ինչիք բալ է բախպա ճուղակ հելեն բա քոչիք կյախլելու բախպա էրոչեն իկյատում ու ագես հաղ կյասը կաղ իկես կշտիլում կոզատ լալյում հելեն իկես իկումալը բաբալը չգարում քոգ իչիչը ինչիք բալ են շպլխ իկմալը բաբանակ դիկը շվեղ, ըբալը ես էր չգիտը դիչը իվակոչը դելը, հելակ կուղ չուգալը դի ես էր դլսիտը դի բարչը լջամը, բլխբակը իչուայլ միտը, դի ուղ պկմալը ուղջ բջգիտավուկակ ես սիվուկակ, Իչիսը ամապոլեշ, իչիչը հլերպուն, իվլ է հեսը, իվլ է լասիտը, իվլ է վարջնը, կլգոգ ահով։ Um, so that was the Crow creation story as told by Medicine Crow. Um, and there are different iterations of the story, but at the core of it, we all understand that we were made from this earth, men and women, and then created from the same mud, that we are equal, that we are precious, that we have a purpose here. And so I started with that because I think one of the things that really holds the people of this state together are our narratives, our stories, who we understand ourselves to be. When that's oral, that's written, uh, it's something that we take pride in. We sit together and we tell stories all the time, whether, especially in the winter time, I mean, there isn't too much else to do unless you ski. <laughs> um, and so at the foundation of this exhibition, is who are we? Where did we come from? What is our purpose here? By looking at that creation story and understanding who Crow people are at the core, then we start to build on that. We start to build who we've become today. And today, we are still very much bound and tied to that story, to where we came from. Even the animals within the story, we revere ducks, we revere rocks, we understand that we have a very special relationship with these tobacco plants that are in the Bighorn Mountains. And to this day, we still continue those ceremonies and have conversations and tell the stories about how those plants came to be, how we followed that path and made that journey to get to the Bighorn Mountains. Um, so if, if you didn't already hear, I curated an exhibition at the Field Museum in Chicago um, and it was incredibly serendipitous and did all kind of circles back to um, a University of Chicago professor who was at, he's a philosopher, who was at a Harvard talk where one of the professors talked about Plenicu, Chief Plenicu. And he was so moved by the life of this man, Plenicu, that he came to Montana to learn more. He spent time in the crazies where Plenicu made a fast and he had visions. Um, he came to the Crow Reservation and spent time at the tribal college and got to know people. And then eventually I got to know him. Then because the University of Chicago, their anthropologists essentially feed the Field Museum, they have a very close relationship. They were both created at the same time, constructed around the same time, which is also around the time of the World's Fair. Um, Tesla bringing, uh, electricity to the World's Fair, the first time we'd been introduced to the idea of museums. Um, there were so many things that were happening at that time. The coalescing of all of these um, events essentially came to create the Field Museum. So at the same time, there were collectors all over the country, as you probably all know, um, collecting Native American items, sacred, everyday household items, taking photographs, writing stories. This is how we have the book Two Leggings and this, the book uh, Pleniku. So these anthropologists and their collectors came into our communities and on the Crow Reservation they collected close to 200 war shields. 
And these war shields are now spread across the world. They're in Mexico City, they're in Germany, and luckily for us, there's 78 of them at the Field Museum in Chicago. So they've been sitting there for over 100 years. They haven't seen the light of day. And this professor who has this intrinsic relationship with the Field Museum happened to know all these crows. And he brought some of these people in, myself being one of them, and um, I was asked to consult about a hall that they were getting ready to build. It's up now, it's the Native American Hall 8. It's at the Field Museum, it opened last year. So they're preparing for this particular hall. They're gonna renovate everything, bring in living Native people to reinterpret everything. It was a big deal. And so they didn't know what they were getting themselves into and they invited me because whenever I do something or I consult, one of my favorite things to say is like, what do I care? I'll be sitting in a folding chair on the banks of the Little Bighorn. With my aunts and my grandmothers and my sisters, I'm gonna tell them what I think. So um, I got myself into it that time because after I told them what I thought they should do and what I imagined an exhibition to be, which was obviously Crow because we're known to be ethnocentric in that way, um, they invited me back and they said, we happen to have like this huge 6,000 foot square, square foot sh exhibition just completely fail. We need something. You have an idea. We've got the stuff. Let's make it happen. So within a matter of nine months, I think that's ironic in its own way, um, <laughs> we gave birth to Absaluga Women and Warriors. It was hard work. It was a lot of work. And being the first Native American person to create something like this in an institution of this magnitude is, is it can be painful. I mean, obviously it's glorious and we get to sing the songs of our people, um, but there's a lot of work to be done in so far as collaborating between anybody. It doesn't matter where you come from. It's just hard work to really um, give birth to something like this. And working with others, working with my own people, it took a lot of devotion. You have to be dedicated to something like this. It has to come from your heart in order for it to work. Um, so with that, this comes from a Montana news source, so I'll just throw this now up there real quick. news from Bighorn County to the big city. The Crow Tribe will be front and center at the Field Museum in Chicago. Salica Woman and Warriors opens today. It features the work of 20 Crow artists ranging from fashion to paint, sculpture, beadwork, film, music, and photography. The exhibit is curated by Nina Sanders, who grew up on the Crow Reservation in Gary Owen. It's the museum's first large-scale exhibit curated by a Native American scholar. The artists and others featured in the exhibit traveled to Chicago this week for a VIP reception. One feature will be seven never-before-displayed Absalica war shields. The Field Museum says for many years, Native American communities were given the opportunity to tell their stories in museums, which is why they saw it important to share the story of the Crow tribe. Absalica Women and Warriors runs through April of 2021. They so I thought they did a better job than I could in like <laughs> one minute. I'd go on and on, uh, and, and I appreciate it because uh, we had really good coverage in the state of Montana. We had a lot of support. We still continue to get support. Uh, we were on the cover of newspapers. Con people still continue to talk about this exhibition. It was one of the most exciting things, and I think at the center of this, besides the living Crow people themselves who made contributions are the war shields that were ex exhibited. These war shields are precious in that when they were taken from the community, many of them were still believed to have power. There are incredible stories in the archives from the collectors who had relationships with the owners of the shields, the people who had the visions, who made the shields, who understand how they work. A lot of that information was chronicled, it was written down, some of that became um, books that we can check out in our library today. Uh, these stories, one in particular is uh, there's a shield that was sold to a collector and everyone in the family lined up to say goodbye to this shield and it's not allowed to touch the ground. 
because it's holy. Everything on a shield comes from the sky, whether they're constellations, birds, even the ermine that jump from tree to tree. The power of the sky is what fortifies the strength of this warrior, to say it most simply. And so this is why they can't touch the ground. When they do touch the ground, it rains. And you know, we, one might think, oh, well, that's the superstition. How do you know, especially an anthropologist? Uh, but lo and behold, as these people were out in our community and they would break those rules, purposely put the shield on the ground just to see if it would rain, and it did. And that's written down. Uh, there's incredible stories of collectors being told that rocks are medicine. They're beings that were here before human beings. And they have the potential to make incredible things happen, watch over us, provide for us. So uh, these anthropologists would hear from these people who own these rock medicine bundles that if you put two particular tops, types of rocks together and let it sit for a little bit, and you open it up, there'll be a third rock. It'll have a baby. And of course, they didn't believe that either. They tried it. And if you look at anthropologist journals of people who collect rock bundles, you'll see over and over that absolutely shocked and surprised, I did it, and there's a third rock. I want to know how this happened, right? So this family who passed this shield to this collector, he puts it down on the ground, and he starts to bag it up. And you know they're crying. They're moved. They're devastated. They need money to feed their family. Um, and lo and behold, it starts to rain. An incredible thunderstorm happens. And he was so moved by this event that it frightened him. And from that point, the collectors and the people who were handling these objects were instructed, you should probably listen to the Indians. Do what they say. <laughs> Let's not take any more risks. So you know these things still have power to this day. Um, a little piece of information which is part of this story is this exhibition came from the Field Museum to the Museum of the Rockies, if any of you saw it while it was there. The day that these shields and these items got to Bozeman, it started to rain. And within a few days, it completely broke the Yellowstone. The Yellowstone River broke down all of the roads and they shut down Yellowstone Park. So. Um, this is something that reoccurs. Is it a coincidence? Maybe. But as far as we're concerned, we knew that would happen. If we move them, if you take them out, there will be a supernatural, some kind of an event. Um, and every time this happened, it humbles us. It teaches us that these things that come from this place, from Montana, from these mountains, they still hold power just like the land, just like the people. So, now some it was, whoops, big. whoops, there we go. So, there were probably 30 Crow people who made contributions to the exhibition, whether it was through creating art, music, writing. Uh, here we see Balagol is solid. Grant Bultel, who's no longer with us, he was one of our primary advisors as far as the war shields come when we're asked who gave you permission to show them, how do you talk about them, how do you do that? How do you respect a whole community um, in teaching others about these incredibly powerful items? And he was instrumental to that process. A very simple person. One of the ways that he explained these sacred objects who, that are no longer in our community but all over the world is that he would say they're taking a vacation. They wanted to look around, and they'll come back when you're ready. Not them, us. So I think it's something that really got us thinking as a community, are we ready? What does the return of these items look like? What does it mean to the community? Are we prepared to not put them on the ground? Are we prepared to hold them the way that they should be held? Do we understand that today? So we've got incredibly young artists, Del Kerfman, uh, Jory LaFrance, who's front and center in this frame. She's uh, an environmentalist. She's handling the water. She tests the water to make sure that it's clean for people to drink, to practice ceremony in. 
She's examined almost every foot of the Little Bighorn River. She takes samples, she writes grants in order to do that kind of work, to protect the water and the land. This is how we're all made. This is how we're connected. Even if you think that you're not connected to me, our rainfall, our water flow, all of that, we bathe in it, we drink it, it rains on us, it fortifies our hair, every part of our body. So in that way, we are intrinsically connected. And this is something that Jory talks about when she's speaking to the world about our water. And when I say our, I mean us. The way that we exhibited the shields was also part of a narrative in shields are typically cared for by the owner's wife. And this is because when a man goes out to fight, when a man goes out to hunt, when a man goes to work, he wants to come home. What is he doing while he's gone? He's making something for his family. He's strengthening his family. He's providing for his family, his loved ones, his neighbors, the people around him. So the shield would stay home with the wife and then an attachment would go with the husband. And then he would go, he would ride into battle and prayers would be made that he would come home safe. In the way that the man and the woman are called to return to one another, their hearts seek each other out in the same way, so do the shields. So the shield and its attachment are separated, but they yearn to be together again. Why do we fight? What are we fighting for? From the love of our heart, for the love of our life, for the love of our land. So these women were placed above these shields to create balance. It wasn't just aesthetic. It was so when people entered the room, they were essentially enveloped by the love and strength of these women from the past because these shields are so powerful and so masculine and they're understood to be items of war, there needed to be that balance, that reminder. Why do we go to war? What is it that we're fighting for? And the stories are many. Every label on every object tells a story. So in anthropology museums, typically you'd see something that would say, you know, this is a war shield made out of rawhide created by a Crow Indian at this time, and this is what it was for. That's all you get. But the way we wrote the labels uh, was they were stories that came from the people. They came straight from me, so they're first person labels. That was a fight. That was really difficult to do. I mean, the Field Museum obviously prides itself on scholarship and academia. Anthropology is a science, at least they'll argue that. You guys are historians, so you know what I'm talking about. Um, so these stories are important. People have to connect with these objects in thinking about their own lives. The things in their homes that give them power, that remind them of where they come from, what they're doing here, and what their purpose is. And so whether it's a war shield or a pair of moccasins, every single human being has objects in their life and in their family, in their community, that tells a story of who they are and where they come from. And that's what happened here. These are not just objects sitting in a glass case. These are living things. They have ancestors. They have descendants who are still alive today, many of whom continue to practice these medicine ways. An extension of the shields, obviously, if you, if you look at the shields, a lot of people will say those are beautiful, they look like contemporary art, they want to display them that way, but we have to constantly remind people that these are tokens of power and contain power. And so what we did was we brought contemporary artists in to spend time with the shields and end the collection, read some of the archive, go through some of the archives, and then create artworks. So we had multiple artists come into the museum, spend time, and then create artworks. And here you see some of them. This is a Ben Pease painting of Pretty Shield. There's a book about her out there, probably one of the best books about a native woman that exists. The second one is uh, Kevin Redstar. He created this specifically for the show. Uh, in the upper right-hand corner is Dal Kerfman, and that's a painting of uh, two women who fought at the Battle of the Rosebud. 
We understand them to be two spirits, for lack of a better word. In Crow, we call them Bada. Uh, so uh, they're sort of gender fluid. One is a man who conducts himself as a woman and lived as a woman throughout the entirety of, he, entirety of his life and was understood to be a woman. The other was, a, was an actual female born and raised, uh, but did not have a husband, killed several men in the Battle of the Rosebud, they say with a digging stick straight to the throat. Um, that's the ferocity of a pissed off woman <laughs> in Montana. Um, so, you know, he, he painted these women with gold leaf and in a way that resonated with him that he felt like would communicate in a, in a different way to the observer. Another, the other one is uh, Ben Pease, and I believe this one is called the Madonna. We also had historic items, objects that were collected on the reservation in the late 1800s and early 1900s. I show this picture of the moccasins where I'm holding them because that's not typical to a museum space or a collection space. People usually put gloves on. But one of the accommodations that was made for us that if a crow person came in, and it was appropriate, because we don't all just go in and handle anything, it's okay for you to take your gloves off. Some of these things are activated by our touch, our breath, our voice, our language, our songs. And that resonates in its own way, in ways that are not explainable. It's an experience that you have to have. And if you've ever visited a museum or seen some of the things that come from your communities and your families that are incredibly old, you know what I'm talking about. And within that are the stories. So very quickly, my own story, um, these things are meant to be. As a child, I was raised by my grandmother and her mother. And I really just wanted to go to Chuck E. Cheese and hang out with my friends. But we had to do things like wash clothes and the, those big washing machines outside that you would wring the clothes out with. We would pick choke cherries. We would make pemmican. Um, we would put the back strap on the door and hang the meat and it would smell terrible and I just absolutely loathed it because I just wanted McDonald's. Um, so I, you know, I thought I was suffering as like a 10 year old, but the truth is, is that my life was laid out in front of me to get to this place, to stand in front of you. And this is a, um, a link to, or this is part of a website, the Smithsonian Institution, it's a blog. I worked there, um, I was studying dolls and creating curriculum about dolls so families could create dolls for their children that looked like them and that would come with a song that would help parents to mirror, to teach their children different things that maybe were um, amiss. And so in this process of researching dolls, I was asked to go to the Smithsonian where um, I was invited to participate in this archiving project where over 300 photographs were just sitting in the archives and waiting to be digitized. And these digitized photographs could not be put online until somebody went through and checked to make sure that it was all appropriate. There was nothing sensitive, there was nothing inappropriate, it was all cool for the world's eyes. And so going through these photos and doing this job, it was an internship that I did. I learned the systems, the archiving systems, and then I was essentially put in the basements and given these folders with this, the actual negatives. So I'm going through the photographs and I come across this one. This photograph has existed in my family from the time I can remember my earliest memories. It was something my grandmothers, my aunts, everyone in my family had. They carried it around. I carried it with me when I went to Arizona State University to remind me where I came from. What is it that I derive my strength from? This is my great-great-grandmother, Annie Medicine Crow, the, do the only daughter of Chief Medicine Crow, her husband, Frank Bethune, Balagola Salad, and three of her children, or her grandchildren, these are three of her grandchildren. 
and many of them were not born yet. But she made these cradle boards. She made many cradle boards. It said she made cradle boards for every single one of her grandchildren and her children. Now they're in museums. They're in private collections. If you see any of these, let me know. Give me a call. <laughs> we're looking for them. Um, so I come across this photo, and I flip it over, and there's notes on the back. And you know, I don't think that as this photograph existed in my family, and my great-grandmother had nine children, and each of them had many, many children. So now I have, I think the last count was like five or 600 relatives, uh, second cousins, right up to second cousin. So, you know, this family is, this, this photo is really close to us. Uh, it was taken by William Wilchute who was employed by Hai, who, um, if, you, if any of you know, the National Museum of the American Indian exists because of George Hai. George Hai was a businessman. I believe he was in Brooklyn. Maybe it was the Bronx. Does anybody know? Uh, and he was essentially taking money from incredibly wealthy investors, people that we all know, the Vanderbilts, the Bilderbergers, people who built our railroads, they all had an invested interest in preserving Native American items because it was believed that Native American people would no longer be here, the, the myth of the dying Indian. So he took his job very seriously. He collected thousands of items from Native American people in the Plains area, primarily from crows. He's the man who wrote the manuscript for two leggings. He wrote the manuscript, he wrote another manuscript that's been unpublished about plenty coup, medicine bundles. Uh, he, he went pretty deep. He took pictures of the families of every single chief that was alive at the time. And everything was carefully packaged up and shipped off. He was one of the only collectors who took the time to write down where every single object came from. Who were their family members? How did they make them? What is it made out of? Why did you make it? If it was a war shield, if it was a medicine bundle, he usually got to the bottom of why it was made and what it was made for. This isn't typical in a museum collection. You just sort of end up with all sorts of things and you have no idea where they came from or why they were collected, if they're complete. And so what one might believe to be a curse, fast forward 100 years and it's a blessing because these things are ready to come back to us. And they're coming in their own way through images, through stories, and then hopefully eventually the objects themselves. So we remember who they are through these stories. This particular article that I wrote once I completed this project was about how this photo was in my family for my entire life, for all of our lives, and then I learned who took the picture and why. And that many of the objects that he collected came from our family. And so these stories continue in our family today. Uh, here's a little tidbit from uh, the Crow people. There were 70, over 70 Crow people were brought into Chicago to present, to be present, to observe and witness. Uh, and they, they gave us so much space. They did a lot of work to accommodate us. So we paraded through the University of Chicago quad we borrowed horses from the Chicago, the South Chicago Police Force, um, and they trusted us. They were like, go ahead, put whatever you want on it. Um, and miraculously, it all went down the day before the world shut down. So it was March 20th, the day before COVID shut down all of Chicago. All the museums, all the restaurants, people essentially couldn't leave their homes. And so some people had masks on. You know, it was an incredibly scary time. I think at that point we weren't really sure if, you know, we were going to continue our lives the way that we imagined them and have been living them up to that point. So this happened the day before COVID shut everything down, and it was one of the most incredible celebrations, I think, that um, 
I had to speed it up. So just to kind of round everything off, um, you know, again, coming back to the stories, the narratives, the things that connect us. Um, my Aunt Birdie, who's sitting at the table over there, she was actually presented an, an award, I believe, the year before last here. Um, she could tell you more about it. You have to catch her in the hallway, though. <laughs> Um, she's an artist and she's an educator. She's someone that who has done an immense amount of work in preserving the Crow language, perpetuating the Crow language. She brought an app to our community. She taught children her whole life and she to this day still continues to teach whether or not she's in a classroom. And she's one of my partners in crime. Whenever we go to a museum, I'm like, are you gonna come with me? She's, she's like, yeah, okay, I'm with you. So we've done quite a few um, we've done quite a few events, and she tells these incredible stories. And I don't know if you've ever been to um, like a crow celebration or maybe a powwow. There's one particular dance that crow people do, and it's when a man and a woman dance together, and it's kind of similar to like a two-step. Uh, and this dance has a story, and so. Um, Birdie brought that story to the people at the Carnegie Museum when we opened Absalaga Women and Warriors there. It was in Philadelphia at the, I'm sorry, Pittsburgh at the Carnegie. And essentially, just very quickly, because this is how things like this come to Montana, is when they first built the trains here, crows would go out to these stops and they would perform and people would give them money and different things and they'd pack up and go home. One particular time there was a group of people that were trained in and the crows were performing and there was this incredibly handsome man who loved to dance and he was there and he'd always show up and uh, one of the women who was part of the group who was a single wealthy woman from New York spotted him and said, come with me, let's go, let's run away together and he did in his outfit. He jumped on the train and he took off with her. And he stayed with her for many, many years. And while they were there, he continued to dance. And he learned all of the different dances that she was doing in New York, the waltz, the foxtrot. And eventually, who knows, you know, maybe they tired of one another. And she, he eventually came back to the Crow Reservation and he brought this ba dance back and he said, you know, they do this really great dance there. I want to try to do the same thing here that would work for us. And so that particular dance that we call Pahalusua is essentially what this man brought back and it was an iteration of the foxtrot. <laughs> and so that was integrated into our cultural way and most people don't know that, but this is a story that, you know, Birdie tells, one of many. Um, Birdie, actually, and you're probably wondering why I have 1923 up here. Uh, she's one of the advisors. I would say she's a costume designer and they should pay her way more. Um, but she teaches the actors to speak Crow. And I think she did an incredible job. And if you are not a fan of Yellowstone, which you know... <laughs> Let's all, let's all do a petition now while we can. Um, 1923 I thought was particularly beautiful because obviously my beloved aunt is um, one of the primary advisors. She dressed 
the actors. She taught them, she taught the producers and the directors, like this is what happened for Crow people in boarding schools. These were some of the experiences. This is what a man would have looked at, looked like at the time. So note, in 1923, it's one of the only one of that series that's actually historically accurate insofar as the costume design. And the sort of relationships between the actors or you know, the people that they're playing. And so, you know, Birdie's narratives, her stories are making it into this series. And I think that that took time, because when, when the people who make Yellowstone, Taylor Sheridan, first came here, you know, he had his own idea of Montana. And I wrote down a list of all the movies that are informed by Montanans, their stories, their lives, and their histories, and that's Little Big Man, The Revenant, Yellowstone, Legends of the Fall, A River Runs Through It, Lonesome Dove, those are all movies that essentially inform the world about who Montanans are. What do Montanans believe in? What do they do? And one of the, the things that exists in all of these stories is this love, passion, courage, this sort of drive to make something magic happen and to be essentially fortified by the supernatural powers of this land. Right, I mean, The Revenant, you've got that guy who's curled up in a dead horse, right? And at that point, I would have been like, God, just take me, I'm not <laughs> curling up in a dead horse. I love it here, but I'm done. Um, a river runs through it, you know, that's all about fly fishing. How many people started to take up fly fishing when a river runs through it came out? The Bighorn River, which flows through our land, is probably one of the most lucrative rivers in the world. From, from fly fishing. Um, so the world's idea of the Wild West, of westward expansion, of courage, of passion, of love for family, the land, that a lot of that comes from Montana narratives, Montana stories, the people who are here who've essentially formulated this state. And that comes from within. So to wrap up, uh, I think I told you a few stories in there that I think are all kind of grounded in this place with this people. Um, it's precious to us. I think all of us understand how important these stories are and how we track history, how we tell those stories. And even most importantly at this point in the way that I see it, the way that Hollywood textbooks, anybody who has never lived here, who hasn't had this experience, who doesn't understand what sort of fortitude and commitment it takes to be part of the state, to be a lifelong resident and to come from many lifelong residents, whether you've emerged from here or you wandered here, uh, are precious. And it helps people understand how incredibly powerful, beautiful, and strong human beings can be. Not, any, not just any weenie can come to this state and survive. <laughs> I don't care when you got here. So um, I'm really thankful to be here. Thank you for letting me tell you our stories. We have a book called Absalaga Women and Warriors. It's on Amazon.com. It's on the University of Chicago Press website. All the proceeds go to the Tribal College. It's specifically about this exhibition. You can see every object that was in the exhibition. Information about the artists. Um, I ask that you know you learn more about Crow people. I hope that we're invited back. Um, to talk more about our culture and our language. I appreciate everything that you do. I came to this place because of historians, educators, archivists, curators, museum professionals. It isn't without people like you that someone like me can be standing here today. Oh.